Good morning. Thanks for tuning in to my channel. So, once again, I'll be taking a look at this historical phenomenon that we're calling mud flood. And if you're not familiar with that, please check out The Biggest Conspiracy in History on Philip Druzhenin's channel, and it talks about mud flood, just in case you're not familiar with it. And I'll try and leave a link in the description below. Uh, getting right into it, one of the problems I've had is that when you go to look at old photography, say from the year 1859, if you start going much earlier in time, you're not going to find a whole lot of images. It seems that photography was not as widespread pre-1859. I'm not sure the exact date on these images, I can only rely on what Google Images is telling me. This is Market Square from the upper floor of City Hall in 1859. This is actually in Kingston, Ontario. And these photos are interesting because, you know, there's not a lot of people in these old photographs. Uh, there are windows intact. The streets aren't paved. There are some earlier images than 1859. Here's one of 1855, supposedly. The picture above, taken in 1855, may be the oldest existent photograph of New York City's Hall building. Here's a picture in Kansas City. My point is that if we go looking for pictures of city images in the, eight, in the year 1855, or earlier, we start getting uh, more hand-drawn depictions of the cities. This one's neat. This is 1855, and apparently this is in Philadelphia. But interesting, there's not a whole lot of people around. And again, this is a big, major U.S. city, so shouldn't there be people? So, what are we to do if we want to see images of cities before the years 1859, 1855. What can we do? So I had an idea. I thought, well, maybe I'll look at some bank notes because on some of the bank notes uh, there might be pictures of, of buildings. So I went through the process of just looking at old bank notes and trying to see the earliest years I could find. I've got some more commentary on what I'd like to talk about related to banking, but I'll keep that information towards the end of my video. I did come across the following banknote. I'll leave this website on currency in the link in the description below. But this is in South Carolina in the year 1855. Now back in these years, uh, banking operated differently and local community banks would issue their own paper banknotes. They would issue their own currency which were redeemable in gold or silver, particularly silver dollars. So this is from the Bank of South Carolina. I'd just like to zoom in on this part. And so here's the year 1855. And on this note, you can see that the 55 is written with pen and ink. So that's generally how the system worked. And so it started with 18, and then they would write the year, and I guess the month. And they would use a similar banknote for decades. They might use the same style of banknote and they would just keep printing them and then they would change the year each time they issued a new uh, banknote. What is interesting is if you go back and you start looking for banknotes um, pre-1862 then you'll find there are many different state banks and community banks in different states
and it seems that a lot of the bank notes for different banks around the United States had their notes printed in places like New York and Philadelphia. In this instance we have uh, Bald and Cooseland and Company in Philadelphia and it seems that there's actually a small group of printers out there doing the lithographs for these banknotes which does indicate that I'm not saying there's a central authority for banking at this time but that at least you know there's certain printing houses that are printing banknotes one that shows up a lot is the American Banknote Company anyway I'll try to touch on more of this information in a moment the reason I'm showing this banknote is this is the year 1855 and here you have this bank here and it has signs of mud flood at the base of it so although photography in this era is scant we can at least see according to these banknotes that um, you know mud flood occurred even at this time so this pushes the date of mud flood um, no later than 1855 another lingering question that remains unanswered in my own mind is how they would have produced this image on a banknote granted this is not a photograph this is a drawing but to produce a drawing like this I think you would first need a photograph I mean I don't think somebody drew this by hand that just seems way too complicated so I'm assuming that such a banknote um, originally came or the design of this originally came from a photograph and what still remains unanswered unanswered in my own mind is how in 1855 they were able to produce printing with this kind of artwork on it this is very intricate and detailed and I don't think that this is hand-drawn it almost looks like something that you would need computer software to design to design things that look like this so I still can't reconcile that one and if you think that maybe they did have this technology in, eight, in the 1850s um, go back and look at some of the older notes it goes back to about the 1820s where you see they have the ability to print designs like this on money I think even today my printer at home can't print things this detailed I mean it could print this picture but it, the intricacy even of the when you zoom in on this like like there so that's pretty incredible what I was excited to find is that this building is still standing today I searched Google images for the State Bank of South Carolina building Now I'm certainly not an expert on the history of excuse me I'm not an expert on the history of banking in America but I'm just showing you what I'm currently trying to look at and unfortunately I haven't digested all the history so I can't come up with a conclusion but currently I'm reading this book because I actually have a copy of it here at home and what I was excited to see is that you can actually uh, get an audio version of this book on YouTube somebody has read uh, at least the first couple chapters of it so here it is here I'll try and leave this as a link in the description below what I thought I could do was sit down and read this book here at home and spend a couple hours reading it and then come back in one of my YouTube videos and try and explain the banking system as to what was going on between the War of uh, Independence and the Civil War but it's complicated and I can't say that I fully grasp it at this point there is some overarching authority even at the time of the War of Independence in 1776 and even the original Constitution where it ok 
okay my free trial software video recorder got cut off but anyway even in the Constitution there's some things explained about who the authority of coining money is so this is an old issue and you know going on the gold standard and going off of it uh, seems to be a theme in American history even up to the 1970s with uh, Nixon so I'm not sure what was going on but I do want to point out one thing in the year 1862 while the Civil War was going on the federal government had exclusive authority to print uh, greenbacks so this is like a um, like a federal authority that's printing money and even in 1862 they printed a fiat currency that was not even backed by gold so I'll just read the first couple paragraphs legal tender cases 1870 1871 so this is the time of the reconstruction this is after the war two cases decided by the US Supreme Court regarding the power of the Congress to authorize government notes not backed by specie that means gold or silver as money that creditors had to accept in payment of debts so this is the beginning of legal tender and they're, they're saying that basically legally uh, the money we print you have to use for uh, paying debts to finance the Civil War, the federal federal government in 1862 passed the Legal Tender Act, authorizing the creation of paper money not redeemable in gold or silver. About $430 million worth of greenbacks were put in circulation, and this money, by law, had to be accepted for all taxes, debts, and other big obligations, even those contracted prior to the passage of the Act. And if we just do a Google image search, of US banknotes in 1862 this is around the time where we start getting bills with United States written on it as opposed to small individual banks in different states like the Bank of South Carolina right. interesting to note and I have to look into this further that the Confederate States actually had a wide uh, printing of Confederate States of America bills as well Here's just a screenshot that I actually found the Legal Tender Act itself. And I don't want to get confusing and off topic, but going on in the in the UK, um, you had a similar phenomenon where you probably had smaller banks issuing their own bills of exchange or paper currency, and then according to the Act of the Bank Charter Act of 1844, this is in the UK, you have the Bank of England um, taking exclusive authority over the issuing of banknotes. So it seems like in the United States this happens also but like in about 1862, so later than the Bank of England. So why am I even talking about this and why is it important to look into the history and see a central banking authority giving it itself the exclusive power to issue banknotes. Well, I'm not really sure, but it shows that somehow, sometime in history, uh, the banking system was overhauled and changed. And you basically deprived these small little banks of issuing their own currency, their own paper banknotes. There was a situation in 1857 where supposedly all these small little community neighborhood banks were having a crisis of not being able to uh, pay out all their banknotes that they issued in gold or silver so they call this the panic of 1857 I still stand to understand this a little bit better and learn more about it but it basically says what I just said that in the UK there was the Bank Charter Act of 1844 which gave the Bank of England exclusive authority to print banknotes and then only until like the Civil War in 1861 did the United States have this central authority or basically uh, central banking authority to issue banknotes and to me why this is important is because it looks like we have a bit of a takeover right
Okay, so this final part of my video is a little bit sloppy. I'm just going to show you what I've been looking at lately. And I don't come to you as an expert. I'm, s I'm trying to figure this stuff out myself. So I'm learning as I go. So I just saved some images on my computer that were interesting to me. And I'm going to go through some of them and just point out a few details that caught my attention. Okay, so this is a Latvian banknote. And I'll just point out that, you know, it's from 1928. And uh, who's printing it? Well, you have printing done in London, England. So maybe that's understandable. Latvia was a small country. Maybe it didn't have the same printing technology available to it, you know. And it was just more convenient to have it printed in London. But this is an interesting thing because, I mean, if you're relying on another country to print your bank's banknotes, then, um, I don't know, is that an indication that authority for issuing currency might actually lie elsewhere? And ultimately indicate uh, another overarching authority altogether. Okay, so here's another example of what I mean. This banknote, um, I'm about 95% sure, is from Mexico. And, well, look who's printing it. You have the American Banknote Company in New York printing the currency for Mexico. So I guess the question I'm asking to myself and you if you're listening, thanks for listening, um, is whether or not, you know, the fact this Mexican note was printed by the American Banknote Company is benign, like there's no harm in that, or whether it's actually an indication that, you know, there's a central authority somewhere like in New York which actually has the monopoly and even power hold on the printing of currency. So here's another example of a bank note, you know, pre-1860s where you have small individual banks having the ability to issue and make their own paper currency. So this this is the Bank of West Florida, uh, $10, and it's from 1832. Somebody penned in 32 for the date. And interesting, even though there was all these different neighborhood community state banks all over the place, all across the United States, you still have um, printing from places in New York and Philadelphia. So you have Rodden, Wright, Hatch, and Company, New York. This name shows up a lot. Sometimes the last names will be different, but you do see a lot of these names popping up over and over. I, it stands to be uh, researched. I, I'm not exactly sure who was printing all the money at this time. And once again, even at this time, I know there's lithography is what they call it, but I'm still pretty impressed at how in the 1830s they were printing such intricate detail. This is before laser printers and the printers we have today. So how did they how did they create this? Okay, same style. We've got this small community state bank, Bank at Magnolia. The Merchants and Planters, Bank at Magnolia, 1833. And again, it's printed by Rodden, Wright, Hatch, and Company, New York. Now, this is a state bank in Georgia. It's from 1858. It's printed by Bald, Cooselands and Company, New York and Philadelphia. And just a detail, by looking at the pictures on some of these old banknotes, I noticed that there are a lot of these aqueduct type of systems, and you have a train going across over the top almost indicating that what these are are not necessarily aqueducts but actually like train train roads in a lot of other mud flood videos people seem to have been pointing out a lot of these aqueducts which appear all over the world even in places like Afghanistan and very far off places these aqueducts show up
Okay, so this is the Bank of Newton. It's in the state of Ohio. It was printed in Ohio by Doolittle and Munson in Cincinnati. One of the specific things I was looking at in these old bank notes that like local banks were issuing their own paper currency is to look for images of buildings because again it's very difficult to find photography in the year 1846 but we do have it on the drawings on some of the bills. Again, how they reproduced some of these drawings which aren't from photographs is another question. What I was hoping to find is images on even these bills which would show evidence of mud flood. I can't say I can find it in this image. I came up a little empty-handed but what I was hoping to find is to find some really old banknotes with dates on them which also included images of mud flood buildings. And it was really challenging to actually find old bills with um, imagery of buildings on them. I just couldn't find a whole lot. And I'm also saying that's what I couldn't find. I couldn't find a whole lot of images of old buildings on banknotes. I'm not saying there's a reason for that, I just I, it was a challenge for me. This contradicts what I was saying a little bit. Um, there's the Legal Tender Act of 1862 where you had United States greenback notes. So here you have 1873, which is after that time, and you still have a small bank printing its own paper currency. The Mechanics Bank and Farmers Building and Loan Association, Richland County, South Carolina. Uh, this comes a lot. This comes up a lot. This is the American Banknote Company in New York. Maybe it's not the right time to say it, but even in Canada, there's actually American Banknote Company Ottawa or Canada on some of the Canadian notes. So this is the corporation of the city of Albany, which is in New York. And this is 1862. This is for small change, this is for 10 cents. So I guess I'm answering my own question, but I'm guessing that the Legal Tender Act of 1862 didn't necessarily eliminate the ability for local banks to produce their own paper currency, but at least it allowed the United States, maybe Treasury, to print their own bank notes and have them not redeemable in specie like gold or silver. So this is 1854, the Manufacturers and Mechanics Bank of Columbus, Georgia. And if we zoom in, if we zoom in we have another example of these aqueduct type of bridges with, I think that's a train going across. And it's got one of these last name companies, uh, Dan Danforth, Wright and Company, New York and Philadelphia. The Bank of Morgan, 1857, Bald, Consland and Company, Philadelphia. This is also in the state of Georgia, Phoenix Bank of Columbus, and again, well, 1843, but you've got Rawdon, Wright, Hatch, New York. That, that's a very popular one, like a printing place. Uh, this came up, I think I saved this image because of this symbol. This is almost something I want to cover later as to what this means, I don't know yet, but it shows up on, you know, the Canadian Parliament uh, coat of arms. But even in Boston, on the front of some of the old buildings there, you'll see this symbol. So this is a bank note from the Royal Bank of Australia. Okay, I saved this image because once again you have this style of bridge here. This is the Tallahassee Railroad Company, American Banknote Company. This is pretty old. This is from 1827 in New York. This is from 1817, the Bank of Hudson, so New York.
Okay, this is the Madison County Bank, $1, Casanova, printed by Durand and Company, New York, from 1847. I guess this is just a note to self, but I'd like to look up some of these places, like the New York Safety Fund, and find out, you know, if such a institution came to an abrupt end at a certain period of time. I'm asking whether the lineage of these institutions survive even into the institutions we know today. This would actually give an indication of maybe a mud flood or catastrophic event or some type of reset if we can't trace the lineage of these old institutions. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saved this image on my computer because it had some old imagery of buildings, which is actually rare on a lot of these notes. It's hard to find. This is 1836, the Franklin Silk Company. A very familiar printer comes up again, which is Rodden, Wright, and Hatch in New York. Here's a close-up. This is from 1817. This is the Mechanics Bank of Memphis, so Tennessee. And what caught my attention is that he's got some pretty high-tech machined equipment here for the year 1854. Danforth Wright and Company, New York and Philadelphia was the printer. Okay, I'm going to actually, I'm going to show some uh, websites which talk about the history of this building or this bank, excuse me. Um, this is from the province of Canada, the Bank of Clifton. Now Clifton Hill is the area near Niagara Falls. I think it's the old city name. And I think even during the War of 1812 there was like a Battle of Clifton Hill, which I should know more about, but I don't. But anyway, this is printed by the American Banknote Company of New York. And this company still survives today and I think it's related to the Canadian Banknote Company which prints our money today in Canada. Uh, what struck me about this uh, banknote is that you've got an old building and apparently this is going over the Niagara Gorge so you see the uh, the Niagara Falls in the background which is pretty wild because 1859, 1850, yeah, I think that says 1859 um, we had the engineering capability to build a bridge that not only could handle one train going across but apparently two. And there was a website that discussed this. It relates to the tourism in Niagara Falls. There's actually a few websites and I'm going to try and remember to leave descriptions, sorry, links to this in the description below. Now Samuel Zimmerman Samuel Zimmerman, the man considered to be the founder of the city of Niagara Falls, was born on March 17, 1815 in Huntington County, Pennsylvania. Very little is known of his life before he immigrated to Canada in 1842, where he soon became a very prominent citizen. He was a shrewd businessman who quickly made a fortune in construction work. His first undertaking was the construction of the Four Locks and an aqueduct in the Welland Canal. After that, he received a contract to build 129 miles of railway track for the Great Western Railway, thereby extending its lines to Niagara Falls. Zimmerman was, Zimmerman was also instrumental in the construction of the second suspension bridge over the Whirlpool Rapids in 1854 to 1855. So that puts a date on this bridge in the picture. This is a Bank of Montreal certificate. Um, I guess for $50. So this is a banknote, even though it looks a little bit more like a stock certificate. And this is just a note to self because this symbol appears on a lot of old banks even in the air area around me. There's a big building downtown, Bank of Montreal building that has this uh, almost like statues on the front of the building. It's just So Bank of Montreal, 10 shillings, 1849. Again, it's printed by Rawdon. I think that's the name that always comes up in New York.
So now the year is 1887, and it looks like we've got national currency. Uh, I'll just read it. The national national currency, this note is secured by banks of the United States deposited with the U.S. Treasurer at Washington, the exchange, uh, I guess, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, National Bank of Pittsburgh. Okay, so this is from 1833, 1853, not sure. Bank of the Republic, State of Rhode Island. It's printed by the American Banknote Company in New York. I think I picked this because it had the building on the front. Again, American Banknote Company, and this is Louisiana, 1860s. So I don't know if this is uh, before the Legal Tender Act of 1862. This is not that impressive, but it came up on that currency website I was looking at earlier. Uh, this is a banknote from 1815. It, it's easy to think that so, something like this might be... It could even be a forgery. Uh, that's uh, an extreme accusation, right? But, like, I don't know, could you print something like this out on your printer? Uh, this is just a very old note, 1817. Mechanics Bank in New York. The Bank of Ithaca, so this is in New York. Rodden's name comes up again. Rodden, Clark & Company, Albany. I can't see the date on this, but I saved it with the year 1836. So this is probably from 1836. This was from 1841. What struck me about this note is that it almost looked like photography. Photography of a, a statue or an image. I, mean, I can't explain it completely, but it just had that look to me, like someone didn't draw this, that this is actually like a photograph. Which would be, you know, this is 1841. We don't have a lot of pictures from then. So this is the bank of the state of South Carolina, a $4 bill. Uh, 1855, I think. Bald Coosland and Company, Philadelphia. Bald Adams and Company, New York. Well, that's the printer, or like the signing authority. And I don't know which fort this is. I'm not sure. Probably one that's in South Carolina. Is it a Star Fort? Not sure. This is in Alabama, Central Bank of Alabama. Bald Coosland and Company, Philadelphia. Maybe Bald stands for Baldwin. Baldwin, Bald, and Gooseland. Again, what I was really trying for was imagery of buildings. Again, because photography is limited to going back to the 1850s, 1860s. This is from 1857, Eastern Bank of Alabama. Rodden Wright Hatch and Edson in New York which is the American Banknote Company, printed this. Again, you've got this aqueduct type of bridge with a train going over top. This is in the state of Georgia, Bank of Columbus, Baldwin Bald, Coosland, New York, and I guess Philadelphia. And, well, we've got a building, and I don't know, not 100% sure, but could this be signs of mud flood at the foundation of the building? Looks kind of like it. Uh, are there windows on this building? Not really sure. Um, notably, the building doesn't really have a front entrance. So we look at, at a lot of, um, you know, mud flood buildings and just old buildings. You know, they tend to build like a colonnade type of facade and have like a set of stairs going up to the second story. I don't know if they use a quick cut saw, but they tend to like modify a, an old window into a doorway, but I'm not really seeing doorways on this building, period. If you've ever if you've ever heard of the expression as rare as a three dollar bill, well here is a three dollar bill. I think it's from eighteen thirty six in New York. You've got a guy pouring out a bucket of water. I don't know if that's the Aquarius symbol. Um, here's a the Bank of Nova Scotia a demand note. You've got the Canadian Bank Note Company Limited as the printer.
Here's a good example of a Confederate note. This is the Confederate States of America. I'm not sure if this particular banknote expired at a certain period of time, but this is printed by the National Note Company, National Bank Note Company. I have this as uh, the year 1861. It doesn't appear on the note it looks like, but I saved it as 1861 from another website. This is actually part of the history after the um, Confederates lost. There was an oath that people had to take to end up holding office within southern states. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with the public lands of the state pledge. Actually, maybe not. I'm just rambling. This is from the Bank of New England at Goodspeed's Landing. Not sure where that is. I probably saved this because we've got some uh, buildings. This looks to me like a greenback, but I'm not 100%. We don't have a date. It's 18 blank. I'm thinking that it's pre-1860s because that's the style of banknotes before then at local banks. American Banknote Company, New York. It says City of Hartford. We've got the American flag. Well, we've got some mud flood ev evidence even on on this building here, it looks like. This is from 1836. The Bank of Commerce in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Danforth, Wright and Company, Philadelphia and New York. And they're holding a stick with a red heifer on top. Or what do you call that? Am I saying that right? No, it's not a red heifer. That's from the Bible. That's a Phrygian cap. This is from 1843. I, I'm forgetting if I covered this already. And I'm back to the beginning of my images. But you've got a few buildings in the background here. Again, Rawdon, Wright, and Hatch, New York. 